come back on the thermal setting. The chances of you, you making it back, doesn't matter which airplane you're flying, your three meter, your four meter, your five meter, doesn't matter. You, the chances of you making it back, unless you just have tons of altitude to burn, is pretty low. And I guess that uh, brings up like one more thing I, I didn't write down, but I, I wanted to talk about with this coming back. Um, you see people, they're high, and they've got, and, the, and there's a breeze, and they've gone way downwind, and they stop their airplane because they don't want to give up altitude, but they want to get home. And they, they, if you fly close to zero ground speed, it doesn't matter how high you are; you'll never get home. You have to come back when you have to come back, even by this eccentric path, with at least 50 percent of the airspeed in ground speed. You gotta, you've got to burn, you've got to give it up. You've got to give up the energy you gain to come back. And especially with these hand launch gliders, which will go fast if you're willing to trade in it, if you, you know, keep the energy in the airplane. You put that nose up, they'll stop. And now you have to do all this sort of diving to get some energy again to penetrate the wind again. So um, the two things about coming home from downwind, now that I'm encouraging you to go there, is follow an eccentric path and especially if you, by the way, if you, you've got all kinds of signals here, other airplanes and so on, look who's in lift between you and them on the sides and follow the eccentric path of people, other people's thermals, right? Uh, and then the other thing, of course, um, is keep your ground speed up. Uh, if you can, we were doing this at IHLGF and, you know, it's one of the things I was not launching near as high as the next competitor that made the fly out. I was... I had a problem with my airplane, it turned out. I was launching 130, 140, some people here could launch that high. And, uh, and I made the fly off, and uh, I would get back home. And it was the finally learning how to use the energy uh, to, to do that. There is a, a truism in soaring, you know, you will launch as highest uh, winds. Um, in hand launch today, we're seeing that that's that it's got less weight than it used to. The airplanes are strong enough, they're good enough, the pilots are good enough, they can overcome. We've got, we've got some pretty cool pilots <laughs> flying hand launch and making, making the finals. What are the rules on the ballast now? <clears throat> um, ballast, the rules are the same, it's the interpretation that we're having trouble with. <clears throat> uh, Mark Draley introduced an airplane, uh, which you can see perfect example of there with a um, I guess it's a wood fairing there, not a, that's just wood, that's just a fairing, right, that you have on your airplane? Right. Um, but people put ballast there, and by the literal interpretation of the rules, that's illegal, because it's not inside the airplane. Never mind, it's on the strongest part of the airplane, and the airplane would literally have to disintegrate before it would lose ballast in that location. The rules just don't forgive that. The rules say the ballast must be inside and secured inside the airplane. And uh, so we're we're working that from I would the science. That. That's is that fairing not part of the airplane? Pardon? Is that fairing not part of the airplane? That's right. right. Uh, the, the, that rule is intended to keep you from taping at a rubber banding. Oh, oh, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. But those there are. If I took that fairing off and substituted for an identical fairing made out of brass or lead, mm -hmm. could I not use that? Um, it, at any contest in the U.S., they'd automatically approve you. At most European contests, they would. But what we're trying to avoid right now is come 2011, when we have our first World Cup, some CD, maybe, maybe you know, outside of the hand launch community, no, that's really pretty universal. It gives us trouble. If it's, if it's inside, if it's out of sight, it's legal. Yeah. So, you know, the trick that people can do is, of course, they can put a piece of Kevlar around there and... <laughs> I made a Kevlar shell for Germany two years ago, just in case, so I could carry that kind of ballast. But um, uh, the rules remain the same, and we try to get them changed to allow for um, ballast that's part of the primary, that's attached to the primary structure of the airplane, and not by screws. You know, that's contained and trapped. That thing is is never going to come off. Um, I'll I'll see ballast come out of other airplanes before it'll come out of that after a destructive event like a midair. Um, basically, uh, I, I would just keep flying that. And you know, if you're ever going to fly a highfalutin contest where it becomes an issue, 
you know, wrap a piece of fabric around it and say it's part of the fuselage, and you're done. What's, what's your read on it? how much ballast to use and why? Uh, it's different. <clears throat> different kinds of airplanes, different amounts. Uh, the planes like these you see here, those are lightweight airplanes. They're biased towards that. They have thinner airfoils, and they carry a little bit less area, typically. They have less area in the wings. So uh, for ours, um, 90 grams is excessive most of the time. Though I, had, I did fly with 90 at Blue Skies over Arizona. Our ballast kit does not sell a 90 gram setup. It's got 30, 50, and 70. In the new, in the new version two has, we designed it so we could have ballast that you know people would could easily make or get from us. Um, so did, 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 oh, uh, uh, on the uh, on the heavy side, five ounces. What's the yellow? 150 grams. What's the criteria for using how much ballast? Depends upon the airplane and your flying style. If you talk to Mark Vela, he'll be flying his Super G in 15 mile an hour, 16, 17, and no ballast. And he'll say, I don't range as far, but I can make better use of the kind of orographic lift, the lift that's coming off of buildings and trees and stuff like that. I can make better use of it. Um, with the ballast out. What about the most winter, of us? What about the winners at IHLG? IHLG, yeah. Um, we all we had a windy, turbulent contest. We had a tree line that was just rotoring the hell out of the field, and uh, excuse me, <laughs> pardon me. And uh, uh, we were all carrying weight. I carried um, fifty and seventy grams, right? So two and a half. I got, yeah, two and a half grams and one and a half grams. Which uh, probably, one and a half ounces. What you got you up to what gross weight? Oh, um, the heaviest I flew was 11.4. That's 90 gram ballast. Um, but uh, I was flying at around 10.8, I guess, most of the contest. Um, in, the, in the afternoons. In the morning, no ballast. And you know, when I, later on in show and tell, I'll show, you know, we rigged it. I forgot to bring the ballast slugs, but show how, where we put it. It's very cool. Um, I, I, I think I, I wanted to tell a quick story. Um, Blue Skies over, over in Arizona last year, Phil Pearson, who makes the Encore, a great man. Some of these builders are really, really great people. This guy is a great guy. And, and he was trashing us, just, just putting tons of seconds, burying us. <laughs> On Saturday, it was windy. And how he was doing it is he had five ounces of, of steel and steel tube, steel rod, and steel tube in his encore, uh, which is bigger area, heavier airplane, yeah, I, thicker I, airfoil. I tube. failed to get back twice, and he made it every time. Yeah, well, well, what happened was is he was going off field, and most of us were choosing to surf. We were like, oh, this is just too many for me. You know, so we're parked up here, and uh, eventually it comes down, and he's going out. And uh, why? Because he had enough wing loading and was willing to range. And so he'd launch, not an exceptional launch, older guy, like me, you know, and, and, and he, he, we, all, we all learned real fast. <laughs> Come Sunday, we were all carrying lots of weight. <laughs> Come afternoon, because it was, it was tough. It was tough. So, um, I, I, yeah, being able to change the wing loading is an important ability, and it's important to understand that you don't lose sync you don't increase your sink rate in a proportion to the amount of weight you, you put in your airplane. It doesn't work that way. It's not linear. So it does, yeah, sure, your sink rate goes down, but your ability to go find lift is much greater. You, you know, uh, I won last year Blue Skies, that one day event, and I won it in one round where I could go off field and get lift, and I maxed the task, and no one else did. And, and that was where I got enough points on Gary Jensen to win. It was that, that ability. Um, I think this plays to every other kind of flying we do. You know, uh, we, we kind of don't pay attention to it as much in F5J because our airplanes are already heavy. <laughs> they already have really great wing loading for moving around. But, um, I mean, it's that skill. Yeah, I, I suppose F5J is not the best example because we can put tons of altitude on the airplane and just fly down in a glide. But in anything where you have to find lift, um, if it's windy, Ballast up. Ballast up, it gives you more options. Um, any other kind of questions? I hope I kick this off in a reasonably good way. Uh,
Good speech. Good talk. Yeah,